Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the Q&A for the film Decoding Watson. My name is Judy Laster. I'm the director, founder and director of the Woods Hole Film Festival. And as I'm sure you're all aware, this is our 29th year. Um, when we founded the festival here in Woods Hole, it was a one day, one hour event. Gradually over the years, it's grown to an eight day event with multiple venues. Generally, we have this happening in person and the streets of Woods Hole where I'm located would be bustling with filmmakers and people running to films. You would be part of that group and we would have Q and A's, we would have live events, parties and more. In the middle of March, along with almost everybody else, uh, it became clear that it was gonna be nearly impossible for us to have a gathering this summer, as large as we normally do, um, that is the kind of gathering we typically think of as the Woods Hole Film Festival. And so essentially from that moment on, we had to reimagine and reconstruct what this festival was gonna look like. And we, along with other colleagues from around the country, spent many hours in conversation and then really just had to roll our sleeves, sleeves up and figure out how to present a virtual film festival. So think of what we've done in the last three months is essentially creating Netflix with live events and with many other things that make this um, unique to the Woods Hole Film Festival without investment capital and with uh, a small group of people working nearly year, uh, uh, you know, round the clock to make this happen. And so we were so thrilled that all of the filmmakers uh, who submitted their films, I'm sure, it wasn't their first goal to be in a virtual festival, but everybody understood the world that we knew had changed and that if we are going to have the ability to have all these incredible films in front of an audience, we all needed to switch together. And uh, so while we're thrilled that you're here and have joined us and are participating in the first Virtual Woods Hole Film Festival, our goal and our hope is that next year, we will be back in person for the 30th, but we've also realized there's some benefits of a virtual film festival, not the least of which is that we can reach people from many different places who may not have a chance to be here in Woods Hole. So um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And um, this festival couldn't happen without the help of many people, our sponsors, our grant supporters, our donors, our community, and most importantly, our filmmakers. So I just want to say thank you, and we hope that you will also enjoy the rest of the festival. It runs through midnight on August 1st, and you can stream films in the platform any time of day. We expect you to stay home and do nothing but watch the films, because there are 187 of them. And you can also vote. We give audience awards, and we give jury awards. So please make sure that you go in and vote. You can vote early, you can vote often, but only one vote counts. So you can vote right up until 11.59 on August 1st. We are making a, a quick change, however, um, because this is our first effort doing audience awards in a streaming situation. On August 2nd, when we give the awards, we will give the jury awards and we will give the director's choice awards but we'll probably give the audience awards at a later date just because it's gonna be, uh, we wanna make sure that people have enough time to vote and that we have enough time to do everything and tabulate everything. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Mark Minucci. And Mark is a very experienced, very accomplished filmmaker, multi-award winning. I can't even begin to name all the films that you've done, so I'll let you do that. But Thank you so much for joining us. And um, you know, after you sort of give us an idea, a little bit about your background, my first, oh, let me just say to the audience, basically Mark and I are gonna talk for about 20 minutes or so. Uh, you uh, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A and we will try to get to as many as possible. Uh, this uh, session will go for about 45 minutes and we hope it will be interesting and interactive. So Mark. After you tell us a little bit about yourself, what brought you to this story? Uh, this is an American experience film, which is a PBS show, but 
what brought you to this story and how, how did you come to decide this was a worthy subject of our film? Great, great question. It's actually American Masters, but okay. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. They're they're frequently confused. Even even we confuse them. Um, but uh, no, American Experience is from GBH in Boston. American Masters is WNET in, in New York. Uh, but it's a great question. You know, this was not a project that would have been sane for an independent filmmaker to try and get off the ground by oneself. Watson is a controversial character. It, it would have taken years to be able to um, raise the money for this film. And so what happened was that Michael Cantor, the executive producer of American Masters, uh, uh, had been developing this film for a couple of years with Jamie Redford, Robert Redford's son. And it came to a point where Jamie, uh, not wanting to wait out the, you know, often, you know, uh, number of years it takes before a film is funded, told Michael that he had to step away from the project. Michael and I, who had had a 20 year history of friendship and working together, called me up and said, are you interested in making a film on James Watson? You don't get a call like that every day. And I immediately said, yes, having you know, made a number of science films, been very aware of Watson, having studied biology in high school, Watson and Crick were, were, were major characters for me. So to be able to be offered uh, uh, the, the opportunity to make a definitive biography of, of Watson was, was remarkable. Uh, the issue remained of how to take what Jamie Redford had done and turn it into something that I would do. Turns out that he hadn't done much. He had done a couple of interviews, so it was fairly simple to dispatch with that question. But there began uh, a two and a half or three year process of making this film about Watson, not because it was something that was a burning passion that I, I had to do, but because as filmmakers, we're often asked, will you do this film? Is this something that's interesting to you? And when one is asked that, you leap in. And uh, if it is interesting to you, and you know you have a, it was almost all but certainly funded at that point when Michael asked me, and, uh, and, and that was the beginning of the project. So it was really a, a tremendously fortuitous, lucky, and uh, you know, uh, it was an honor to have been asked. So uh, that's, how the, that's how the project got off the ground. So um, clearly he participated willingly in the film, right? Um, what does he think of the film? Well, I'm assuming he's still alive. He, 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 he is still alive, kind of. Um, he's 93, I believe. He had a car accident the fall before the film got released. I think it was fall, fall 2018. Uh, he had a car accident that, that, that gravely incapacitated him. Um, but he's still alive. And I'm not sure he's even seen the film, but his family has allowed him to see it. Um, it's a very complicated question about, you know, what, what the family thinks of the film. And again, I don't know if he's seen the film. Um, the family was very, very, uh, particularly the eldest son, skeptical of his father's choice to allow us access. He said, my father's gonna hang himself. My father's gonna, I'll, I'll use a four letter word if I may, fuck himself. And um, I will help you, said the eldest son, but this is going to be a disaster. And in fact, the eldest son was right. Once the film was released in January, 2019, 
there were a number of institutions who stripped his name from their building. Uh, he was definitively stripped of his emeritus roles at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And this film took the damage that had been done to him in 2008 to a definitive level. In other words, in 2008, for those who, who may or may not have seen the film, he made the pronouncement that uh, racial differences, specifically that black people were less intelligent than whites, and this had been genetically um, substantiated. It's a very simplistic answer, uh, which doesn't encompass all the data. And, uh, but as a result of having made those pronouncements, he suffered a major backlash, both as a figure of renown in the science community and in the, and in the historical science community, you know, the, the, the person we learn about in high school who, who with Francis Crick, uh, discovered the structure of DNA. But it was also uh, a, a very, um, was a very um, substantial change in his status at Cold Spring Harbor. He was stripped of all his administrative responsibilities. When this film came out 11 years later in 2019, uh, he was definitively ostracized from Cold Spring Harbor not even, not even emeritus role. He was completely, I guess we could say in this world, canceled. Um, and uh, much to the chagrin of his family. And practically speaking, even risked losing his home, which was uh, um, uh, owned by Cold Spring Harbor, which is on the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory uh, campus. So the film had, had tremendous repercussions um, and, um, but this was all as, as a result of his own, uh, admissions in the interview. None of it was editorial in the sense that as filmmakers, we were making judgments about his points of view. It was a very difficult editorial process for the last 20 minutes of the film, last 25 minutes of the film. This was all due to his... Uh, two or three minute section in the film where he affirmed his views of 2008 of the inferiority of, 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 of black people. So yeah, I really felt like that, that last part of the film it was really sad. Really sad. Although, I mean, sad in what, sad in what respect, Judy? What do you mean sad? Sad in the sense that someone would feel that way. Sad because an old man was being asked the question. It, it's it's a, it's an it's 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 a it's a criticism that's been leveled at me that I took a 92 year old man and and asked him these questions. I think well the whole because if you look at it from the arc of the beginning of the film, I mean this is really how he's how he was his whole career, right? He was used to speaking however he wanted to speak. And it was generally something that did not have a negative result in his own life. Or if it did, the negative result he was able to use for his own purposes. Um, Double Helix, which I haven't read, but clearly sparked um, a lot of backlash when he wrote it. But that is the role that he played throughout his whole career personally. Um, and I just felt it was sad because, you know, I felt like internally he could not really express his true feelings because they're so deep. Not Well, that's an interesting question. Like, uh, could he not express his true feelings or were his true feelings utterly manifest and it's hard for us to accept those were his true feelings having grown up in a generation where you know it wouldn't be too odd to have those feelings I, I don't know the answer well and that's why you know I think the historical context and the sort of 
that you, that we see throughout the film. I also wanted to know more. In fact, I felt like, gosh, this could have been maybe a two part film because there's so much in yeah. it that um, would be interesting to learn more about and so many people uh, who are featured in the film who in and of themselves are worth unspooling a little bit more in a film. And I know when you're making a film, you have to make choices because you don't have yeah. all that time. And so how did you decide when you were sort of uh, putting the story together what, what you were going to leave out? I mean, how did you make your editorial decisions? It wasn't, it wasn't easy. I mean, look, one of the things we left out, and I'll just say this right now, uh, that was kind of an easy decision to leave out, were his way more extreme racial rantings, way more extreme than is presented in the film. Why did we leave those out? Because they were so inflammatory that they would have collapsed the film to a mono issue, his racism. And there's so much, there's clearly so much more to his story than that. Though that is not an insignificant issue. And I, I have to say that that decision was made in conjunction with a very, very respected friend of mine and prominent African-American filmmaker, Stanley Nelson, who said the same thing. He said, when I spoke to him about that, he said, do not put those inflammatory, crazy racial statements in the film because then the film will go nowhere. It'll just be about a crazy old white man who, who's a racist and it'll lose all its complexity and nuance. So that was a difficult decision to not include some of that. And, and we shot it in such a way that um, he felt comfortable making those statements. So if you, if you notice in the film, there's a formal interview which is done with an eye direct. And I won't say he was more on his guard in that interview, because I'm not sure Watson can ever be on his guard. I'm not sure he knows how to be on his own guard. But the more informal interviews, which were done with a GoPro and a small format camera in his home, he was definitely not on his guard. And that's when a lot of those very inflammatory statements were obtained. So we made the decision to include almost none of those. Um, and that was a tough editorial decision. It sounds easy now, but it took months to come to that realization that we shouldn't completely divulge all the stuff he said off the cuff. The other uh, difficult decision editorially was how much to delve into the science. So the science, we, we, we ended up focusing in our science explanations on the structure of DNA itself and not in the subsequent developments of genomics and you know the um, the 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 you know the decoding of the human genome the human genome project because it just exceeded the scope of the film we kept hoeing to that period in 1953 when he and Crick seemingly had discovered the structure of these four bases, A, T, C, and G. And, that was, and, and, and just understanding that, was, we felt was enough to understand the whole historical panorama of how important DNA has become since 1953 to the present day. That, that once you discover the, 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 the structure of the gene and the structure of DNA, you can understand all the technologies and all the, you know, how the G human genome project could exist. If we, had, if we had acceded to the temptation to be very granular about how each one of those technologies had been developed and it, the film would have been plotting and I, we wouldn't have even been able to do it in 90 minutes. So trying to decide at what level we needed to know the science, at what level we needed to <laughs> get back to our high school uh, 
uh, courses in biology and really have a, a graphically driven, fun, hopefully entertaining explanation of what DNA is was, uh, was, was something that took a while to find out. And then, and then the last thing editorially was, um, uh, uh, you know, how much to go into all the developments in, in genomics between 53 and 2012. It was just, you know, it was just too much. So you're right. It would, it could have been an, an amazing eight part series that traced the development of our knowledge about the human genome from 1953 to 2020 with their discovery being seminal and with Watson's personality being a major role, but this was a biography. So we decided to focus on the biographical details to the extent that we could. And, um, and, and, and that, that also raised the question of how to present the double helix as a literary work, as also a piece of science reporting. And so we did a lot of animation, a lot of animation of the text, a lot of animation of the characters to underscore the fabulistic aspect of the double helix, that it wasn't journalism, it was completely subjective experience of Watson, who was relaying what it felt like to be a 22 year old, who was relaying at the age of 40, in 1968, what it felt like to be a 22-year-old, 23-year-old in 1952. Fascinating. But it, so there were so many layers. And in 82 minutes, we, I, I feel we, we were able to skim the surface of a couple of them. But it would have been nice to be able to go deeper. So when you started this film, did you, did you know where you were going to go with it? Or did it? No, no, yeah. did not. Absolutely did not. You know, we do a lot of projects for, uh, you know, for Netflix and 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 and. and Tell and us who we did. For those of us. Partner and I, Jonathan Halpern, um, and my company, Room Six Hundred Eight, and we're constantly asked to spell out the final outcome of a documentary as we're developing the project. I mean, that's just the way you know they're investing money and they want to see the end. At PBS and with a with an executive producer with the talents of Michael Cantor, you can enter the process with a series of questions, not a series of predetermined answers. And you're allowed to spend two years going to answer those questions. So no, we didn't know. We didn't know to the extent to which the book would play a role. We didn't know the extent to which science would play a role. We didn't know the extent to which Watson's personal life would play a role, and we certainly didn't know what he would do at the end of the film in terms of his restatement of his views in 2008. So no, we knew none of that. And so, you know, it's always exciting when you're making a documentary to, to not be writing a predetermined essay, but to be following someone's life in the moment, which we were able to do for two years with Watson. So you, I noticed you used a lot of archival footage and photos and stuff. Where, yeah. did, you, where did you get that material? Uh, I tried like hell to get Hannah Marr, my co-producer, to be on the panel tonight, but she's working. She's an immensely talented archival producer, and uh, she, she, uh, she was able to it's not so much discover that stuff because it was all there, but she was able to compile it. And uh, she and our editor, Alex Ricciardi, would construct these sequences with archival and present them to me. I made a point of not looking at what they found beforehand, so that minimally, but mostly they would accumulate these archival assets and then present me with these sequences and I would just watch it like a film, like a viewer. And I would be, you know, wow, rowing in Cambridge. Wow, you know, these amazing shots. And um, uh, uh, they really, really were the ones who developed the archival track and uh, uh, did a beautiful job of it and for that section of the film. They did. So yeah. you may not be able to answer this question, but I'll throw it out there anyhow. And, and uh, 
audience, uh, feel free to start typing questions in the Q&A or the chat if you're interested. Um, but so in this day and age, so you made this film a few years ago, right? Uh, 2018, 17, 18, yeah. So as science is under attack now more than ever, um, do you think situation we find ourselves in right now um, about all the discussions relative to the science behind vaccinations and the coronavirus, would that have affected the narrative of this film if you had been making that film now? Probably not because it's a biography, but. I may have asked him about it, but you may be happy to know that Cantor came back to me and he has hired us to make a film about Anthony Fauci. So we will get the opportunity to answer your questions in the next year and a half as we make this film about, about Fauci. You've seen, um, oh gosh, I forgot the title of the film, the one about AIDS. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but we're very, very lucky to be able to continue that question in a present tense film about, about Fauci. But that is sort of uh, an interesting issue too, which is, um, can you focus on science, just the science, without really associating the people who are doing the research? And, um, you know, everybody, I would imagine, if you look at them, has flaws. Does that mean then that their science is invalidated? I mean, I'm not defending Watson in any way, shape, or form in terms of his perspective on anything. But do you think that then now the science that he did or the science that he worked on will be thought of differently as well? As a result of what? Uh, thought of differently in what respect? As a result of the person that he is. That he is? Yeah. No. I think, I think he has discredited himself because how how did one of our interviewees put it he reduced human nature to the structure of a molecule and it is so clear at this point that human nature is so much more than a genetic sequence and uh, so I think science, biological science, behavioral science has moved so far beyond the initial discovery of Watson and Crick that he hasn't discredited himself, but he doesn't have anything new to add to the conversation and hasn't had anything new to add to the conversation for 20 or 30 years. I guess, you know, sort of, one question, as, as science moves on, as discoveries happen, you know, um, who owns those discoveries? Don't they really belong to all of us? And then why is one person, I mean, yes, they may have been there at a certain point in time, as you so um, rightly bring into the film. I mean, there are a lot of people that he stepped on along the way, a lot of other people's work that made it possible for this discovery to happen. And so isn't it kind of interesting that certain people are associated with things that may not have happened, but for a lot of predecessors as well. Well, are you, are you talking about Rosalind Franklin? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a very complex issue with Rosalind Franklin. Um, she was not a biologist. She studied coal. She was a technician uh, and a chemist and a scientist, meaning that she posited hypotheses and then went ahead and got the data to confirm them, as opposed to a technician that's only assigned a job ticket to go measure something. Um, but she didn't have the passion that they did. She didn't have the years of thinking about this issue like Schrodinger and the physicists about what is life that they did. She was immensely competent, way more competent as a chemist and as, a, and as an experimental uh, scientist than they were. And 
she compiled an enormous amount of data um, that needed the creative spark of Watson and Crick to be able to synthesize, to be able to be synthesized into a model, into a, into a hypothesis for the, what the structure of DNA could be. Remember, nobody took a picture of DNA then. It was all inference. It was, you know, scattered x-rays. It was, it was uh, the amount of water in a molecule. It was all clues. It wasn't as if they had an electron microscope and they could have snapped a picture of it. Rosalind Franklin couldn't said, well, there's a double helix. This was all immensely complicated and through various clues and mathematics and science and chemistry, one had to posit how these, mo these molecules could be together. She wasn't able to make the leap that Fr Watson and Crick did. However, Watson and Crick... I found this on the web. Watson and Crick... <laughs> Siri is contributing to the conversation. Watson and Crick couldn't have made their synthesis without the incredibly granular data that she had collected. So it's a very complicated question, one that I wish I'd had a little more time to delve into in the film. But it's clear that they didn't steal a ready-made answer from her. They may have obtained the results of her X-ray crystallography through less than ethical channels. That's certainly in terms of science today, it would have been less than ethical. But they didn't take a baked answer that she had and beat her to the punch. And I think it's very important to understand that. She had data that without being synthesized into an answer was kind of like measurements. They had an idea and no data. And once they had that data, it confirmed their idea. So they were all friends actually in the 1950s, which is something that's very little. She and Crick went to dinner all the time. They weren't arch enemies. This was a this was the, the 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 notion of them stealing and taking it from her is a post Nobel narrative, probably rooted in the 70s and 80s in feminism. It is not what happened in the 50s. They were all dealing with this, and and um, uh. And she even says, you know, gosh, you know, give me another three months and I would have come to the same conclusion. The rancor that we project on them was apparently not there. Hmm. So that's it's what really I'm gonna... interesting. It's really interesting. There's so many interesting stories and yeah. just don't have time to tell them. Um, no, you don't have time to tell them. Right. I, I dealt with the top level, which is that they, they couldn't have lived without her data. And she was, she was not the one to have synthesized her own measurements into a plausible structure of DNA. I, I could only deal with that in the okay. time I had. And we'll move on for, from this topic, but Woods Hole, for those of you who may not know, is a scientific community. Uh, many people here engage in basic research, but um, you know, I guess it sort of seems nothing happens on its own. There's not this exactly. point in time so when we get around to sort of naming people for certain things without including people who participated in helping them, you know, it becomes a little bit squishy. And that's their biggest crime. And so maybe in this time of revisiting people and ideas and issues, maybe the way we confer um, credit will change over time too, um, to recognize the participation of many people who contributed to that important discovery. And clearly sexism played a role in not contributing and, and egotism. They, they were wrong. They were wrong. They did not sufficiently credit Rodislaw Franklin, who was okay. seminal to their discovery. So um, audience, just jump right in if you have any questions. Um, but so 
after, so the film was then on public television and yeah, there will be for what was the response um yeah. what was the response generally well, rate it, the, you know, it, one hates to talk about ratings, but it rated very well uh, in its initial broadcasts. Las Vegas apparently was one of the top markets. Go figure. Maybe you can explain why Las Vegas was one of the top markets for this we'll film. We'll talk about that with our next film. You can yeah. stay up in that Q&A. Yeah. So, uh, uh, very well received. And, um, but, you know, it's on public television, so it doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't it doesn't break through that that threshold which is still millions of people who saw it um but yeah no it's uh uh other than the press it generated and the the real life consequences uh for watson and his family that that the release of this film uh jeopardized their 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 home and uh stripped his name off many buildings you know, I mean, that's that's a lot of impact for a film to have. Well, so that's why, you know, I sort of, that was the first question. Did he participate in this willingly? And, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, I'm yeah. sure you have conflicting feelings, I would imagine, about that issue. No, he, he excellent, excellent question. He participated willingly. I was always very transparent that we would be examining the events of 2008, the, the events that, that took him down. His motivation was to uh, rehabilitate his image. Um, I had no contract with him to help him do that. I was going to tell the story that I wanted to tell. But when it came to those final interviews where he had the opportunity to rehabilitate his image, he didn't. He didn't. I mean, it has to be incredibly clear that this, this film has no voiceover. This film has no uh, editorial voice of God judging Watson. Yes, of course, the editorial changes we make, I'm not going to be, you know, stupid about this. The editorial changes we make are obviously going to manipulate the audience. But we worked very hard to present the final 15, 10, 15 minutes of the film where it was in Watson's voice, and he was presenting his own points of view. So, you know, it, it, uh, it, 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 it is what it is, and it is what it is because of who he is and what choices he made to present to the public. And much has been said by his family and, and, and some others that I took a 92-year-old man who was half senile and I just led him to repeat his greatest hits, greatest racist hits. I, I don't buy that. Um, he, he, he had a job at his office. He was cogent. I'd hear him on the phone. I'd see him perform. My father is 94. He still has patience as a doctor. Uh, Watson was in full control of his faculties in this film. And in fact, he was interviewed in January of 2018 and made some of his most inflammatory remarks. And just to ensure that this wasn't Watson grandstanding, which he loves to do, on a particular interview shoot day, we interviewed him with the exact same question set about his feelings towards racial capability and AQ, IQ six months later, and his answers were identical. So these are deeply held beliefs of his. These are not dementia. And they were well articulated. You know, you don't see a man who's struggling to find a word. Um, so I, I don't think that the uh, dementia excuse or the old man excuse or the entrapment excuse can be leveled here. He entered into this willingly, as you asked. He, his agenda was, uh, and he would call me all the time. He would write me all the time. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do this. And I, you know, I would either not answer him or give him a, a pablum answer because, you know, he imagined that I worked for him, but obviously I didn't. Um, and uh, 
but he was in full, even that, in, even that example of him trying to manipulate his own story by talking to the filmmaker shows that he had no dementia. He was strategically shrewd. So everything he said must be taken at face value and not discounted in any way because of his age. Well, you know, I have to say, it's such an interesting film because like I said, initially there's so many stories in it. Um, thank you for making it hard, hard. Yeah, we had no idea it was gonna be this film when we started, yeah. Yeah, but um, one of the things that we have at Woods Hole, and we're almost out of time, everyone. So if you have a question, this is your last chance. Um, a, a number of years ago, we started a formal film and science initiative to bring together filmmakers and scientists to communicate with each other, to tell better stories about science, to make better films about science. Um, but being here, we also know how many amazing stories there are. And every lab has an amazing story behind it. And whether it's the story of the science itself or the process of doing the science or the people behind it, there's a lot, a lot here. But I think personally now more than ever, uh, given where we are in, as I said earlier, sort of the attacks on science as a credible way of making decisions or, right. you know, it's even more important than it ever has been to have filmmakers like yourself be out there and willing to tell stories, good or bad. However. Well, let's hope we can take all that inspiration that you just delivered into the Fauci film, because the stakes are way higher at this point than they were in nine, you know, for the Watson film. Um, not, not that, not that the racial issues that that he uh, uh, got involved with are insignificant, but this notion of science. Of, 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 the, of this devaluation of science, of the process, uh, uh, we have an opportunity now to really, really make it clear to people how important that is. Well, I, I wanna thank you and I hope that you will uh, bring that film back here. When do you think it will be done? Uh, well, we, we uh, probably will be making the film for uh, 14, 15 months. So we'll probably mix next summer but the summer after that, we'd love to have it with that you. Would be great. Yeah. I have an invitation, sight unseen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. And thank you very much for your questions. And and I and, and we're very, very happy to have been screened okay. at Woods Hall. Thank you. And audience, don't forget, uh, please vote in the platform. Vote early, vote often, but you can only vote once. Thank you and have a great thank night. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate Bye. it. Bye. Bye.